This excerpt was taken from the Warrant Dirty, Rotten, Filthy, Stinking Rich interview with producer Bo Hill. You can listen to the entire interview at fullbloom.com. What were the dynamics within Warrant? My impression is that those guys liked each other, and there wasn't the conflict over the writing because the guys in the band, to their credit, were smart enough to know that Janie was a really, really exceptionally gifted writer. You know, whether you like the stuff or not, he really knew how to craft a song and he knew how to craft a melody, and he was a better than average lyricist, in my opinion. Janie was not only the main guy, he was also the kind of leader of the band, right? Without question. As far as his voice goes, he had a pretty powerful voice, correct? He did. He was, uh, yeah, he, he, had a, he had a very powerful voice. His, his performances in the studio were... You know, he was almost like a one take guy. Yeah, I mean, he was he was really really exceptional. And if and if you ever watch any of their live stuff, I mean, you know, everybody hits a clinker every now and then when you're playing live. But he was again very exceptional in that he had a good ear and his pitch was generally speaking right on. Incredibly gifted as well. I mean, he started. Wasn't he also like a really good drummer? Yes. And did he play guitar? Yeah. One of the things that I really like about Janie's songwriting, Janie's attitude, at least to me, was, okay, if I can't get the song across with one vocal and me on acoustic guitar, then we don't have a song. And I thought that, I, I went, wow, that's that's a, a really interesting way of looking at things. And so I found myself over the course of my career giving people acoustic guitars or, or say, look, sit down, play the chords and sing the song. And let's see what happens. Because we can always go back in and dress it up, put a riff over it or, you know, put a keyboard in there or add harmonies. But when you strip it down to it, its most basic level, which is like Hootenanny style, you know, sitting around the campfire and somebody picks up a guitar and starts strumming. So if you were going to do, I mean, you know, pick any, pick Michelle by the Beatles, right? Anybody could sit down if they learned the chords to that, and they could sing and play in front of the campfire, and everybody would go, wow, what a smash. And that was kind of Janie's bottom line was, yeah, I'm going to render it on the acoustic guitar, and, and if it holds up, it holds up, and then we're good. Then we can arrange it and rock and roll it and do whatever we're going to do. But the basic structure and the, um, and the architecture of the song are holding up. I'm just curious. Do you think you could have done that with Rat? I don't think so. Their whole approach was different. The riffs that Warren would come up with were quite exceptional. And because of the way that Stephen and I worked together, there wasn't any, let's sit around the campfire and, and listen and listen to Warren play riffs and try to get Stephen to sing a song over it. I mean, it just never, it just never happened to work that way. But Janie just, this was his natural way of doing it. And I went, okay, great, let's go. Did you record Janie's vocals any different than, say, how you recorded Stephen Piercy's? I know you had kind of a formula where you would make them run through it a few times. Well, the way that Stephen's voice came out was I knew exactly what to do to make his voice sound that way. With Janie, it was just beat the previous take, beat the previous take. And like I told you before, we would, I'd get three takes, stop, I mean, start to finish. And then the next morning, I would come up and do the vocal comp before the band showed up, stealing the best from the three performances and creating one bionic performance, let's just call it. And then I'd play it to Janie, and I'd say, so what do you think? And he, he said, nah, I can beat it. Okay, great. So we'd keep that one, and then he'd go in and do three more. And then I just continued that process until everybody sat around and nodded their head and said, yeah, that's, that's the one. And that's kind of how we did it. So I was always keeping the best performance and the best work from the previous day until we beat it. Similarly to the way we, we would cut uh, rhythm section tracks. You know, keep one, try and beat it. As far as his voice holding up, was he kind of a workhorse and could do it all day? <laughs> he was. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he was. He was. He was a workhorse. And as I remember, he... He always came in really prepared. I mean, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. And he was also good if I said, okay, that's great. Let's try this. And I maybe hum him an idea. he go, okay. And when it got really good was when he would sing something, I would make a suggestion. And in trying to implement my suggestion, he came up with something even better. That was the sweet spot of 
working with Janie because it was both of us kind of pushing each other to take it up to the next notch. And with great frequency, he would take a germ idea that I would give him and he would render it back to me only 10 times better than the idea I came up with in the first place. And you did quite a bit of backing vocals like you did on Rat. Yeah. And you guys would harmonize and do stuff like that, or how did that work? Uh, I don't really remember. I mean, it was... I don't believe that there was any controversy around any of that kind of stuff. And a lot of stuff Janie and I would do, we did together. Because the idea is, you know, if you think about it like a classical orchestra, if you have three violins playing the exact same part, it's going to sound somewhat different. So if you have three guys singing the exact same line, you're actually kind of creating that fourth mystery composite voice. Of course. If yeah. that makes any sense sure. at all. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't think there would be any controversy. I just uh, assumed when I read it online, I just assumed, yeah, I mean, that's just part of your production at this point. Or I almost looked at it as like how you did the rat guys where you just did stuff when they weren't around. I just looked at it as that's your production. That's part of the bonus of getting you as a producer. Well, yeah, and sometimes it was easier if I, if I heard something. Sometimes it was just easier if I just went in and did it myself rather than me walk somebody else through it just for the mechanics of getting it on tape. And sometimes Janie would have all the background parts that he wanted written. I mean, he knew what he wanted to do anyway, and so I went, okay, great, let's go. By contrast, the warrant guides were very easy to work with as opposed to on occasions with the rat guys. But I'd also think by this point, I mean, you're an incredibly established and successful producer. The rat guys, I think, got used to it because you guys both kind of launch your careers at the same time. So that's always going to breed some contempt. <laughs> At this point, I mean, you're coming in and got a slew of platinum records under your belt, and I would think there wouldn't be any controversy with really anybody at that point on, right? No. Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, the success that I'd had previously to working with Warren certainly was a modifying factor if anybody had any any difficulties with things, because it you know, at that point, it's like, look, you know, the guy sold some records with Rat and sold some records with so-and-so and so-and-so. And so let's give him the benefit of the doubt. That's why we hired him. And with Rat, to be fair, it was more I was thrust upon them, <laughs> courtesy of Doug Morris. So it was it was a, a, a different vibe. I, I, I'll definitely grant you that. So I've got to ask you about the guitars, because uh, there was always the rumor that Eric and Joey didn't actually play on those records. What's the real story on that? This is the true, true story. So we're in pre-production, and I'm listening and listening and listening. Eddie Wenrick, their manager, walks in the door, and I said, Eddie, I need to have a chat with you. And so we walked outside, and I said, look, we're in direct competition with the Van Halens and the Demartinis of the universe, and Eric and Joey are just not at that level at this time. And I think that we're going to get smoked if we continue the way that we're continuing, and I'd like to bring in another guitar player to play the solos. So everybody took a big gulp, and so I called a band meeting. And to their credit, they were, I know that they were very disappointed, but they were so professional, and they were, again, they were so respectful that what could have been World War III didn't occur. They didn't like it, but the guy that I selected to do the guitar work is like one of the loveliest people you could ever meet. He has like zero ego and wound up, as it turns out, giving guitar lessons to Eric and Joey and teaching them the solos that he played. His name's Mike Slamer, very, very talented guy. And he's worked with me on several records, and I produced his second album with Streets with Steve Walsh from Kansas. He was just a genius. I mean, everything that I could think of to say, hey, what about this? You know, boom, there it was. I mean, and his chops and his abilities on the guitar, as well as great arranger and great producer, actually. To his credit, because he was, he really knew and he felt for the situation that I created in a, a rock band that didn't play their own solos. So a lot of sensitivity and a lot of encouragement and a lot of that kind of stuff was wrapped into this. So privately, I, you know, I don't know if those guys held a grudge against me or if there was any problem about that. My recollection was that no, that didn't happen. And, 
you know, we just kind of did it surgically as opposed to making it political and public and all that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, I wanted a fighting chance to get these guys out there and get them going. So it was it was a tough decision on my part, but that's kind of what producers have to do. You know, you have to be able to take as good as you give. And as it turns out, I think I made the uh, correct decision. And again, full credit to those guys because they could have made it really difficult and they did the exact opposite. I will always be very respectful of them as a band for giving me the leeway to make that tough decision. What were some of the other projects that you brought him in on? Do you recall? Yeah, he played on Fiona. He played on, obviously, on Streets. And I think I brought him in on Twisted Sister, too. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that I did because we recorded that one in New York and he was living in Jersey, so he would just take the train in. So... And I'm sure I'm sure that there's probably a half a dozen more. Oh, he played on the uh, Lost Boys soundtrack, and uh, gosh, I'm sure I'll, I'll think of some more. Back to Eric and Joey. So, do they even lay down the rhythm parts for that album? Yes. Okay, just none of the yeah, solos. So, right, and the rhythm parts were fine. They they did a great job on that stuff. Uh, and then, as I said, they took lessons from Mike, and so that when they went out on the road, they're playing their solos. It was kind of a non sequitur that we just saw them live and the souls were all there. So what happened? And that's the story. That's what happened. What was it like working with the drummer, Stephen Sweet? Great. All those guys. I mean, it was all pretty easy and um, I thought he did a great job. I think he was the one with Janie the longest. Yeah. They had a, a group called, what the hell? It was Plain Jane. Plain Jane. That was it. Those guys had been together quite a while. Steven was kind of, he was kind of the quiet one, but I enjoyed working with him immensely. He's, he was great. They were all pretty amenable to at least trying different ideas and things like that, which I tremendously appreciated. Don't 